All right, in the last video, we left off talking about the extinction vortex, which is when you have a small population. Uh, it, things tend to get worse for that population once it gets too small because you tend to lose genetic variation, both just by genetic drift, by random chance, every generation you might lose some alleles in the population, and also there's going to be inbreeding when you have a small population. So. Uh, the greater prairie chicken, which in Illinois is only found in very small isolated populations because most of the prairie ecosystem in the state of Illinois, it's 98% converted to farmland. So this is what the greater prairie chicken looks like. And they are, uh, um, they're smaller than your typical farm chicken, but bigger than a pigeon. <laughs> you can imagine that. And the males have an interesting mating display. They use these pouches that they kind of inflate. Uh, so check out a YouTube video on that. So uh, the population in Illinois, uh, in one particular popula population, got down to less than 50 individuals. Uh, and that's really bad for um, uh, genetic variation. So what they were, tr and, and it looked like the population was continuing to decline because when you have inbreeding, fewer of the eggs are going to hatch. Um, recessive alleles can be, uh, recessive deleterious alleles are more likely to end up in a homozygous state where you end up with these deleterious recessive traits being exhibited. Uh, and that leads to less reproductive success. So they tried an experiment and brought in um, new individuals who were from a different genetic population further west uh, where the populations are a little bit larger like Nebraska and Oklahoma. There are other populations of these, of these uh, birds and it made a big difference. So even though they didn't import that many birds, so you can see they have just here the number of males, you know, the males are more um, visible and easy to count, uh, that right after they imported individuals, uh, reproductive success increased. And that indicates that part of the reason for the decline in the species was inbreeding, and that leads to more recessive alleles ending up being expressed, because if you remember, uh, recessive alleles are only seen in the phenotype in the homozygous condition. And uh, the cl more closely related two individuals are, the mo more likely they have the same recessive alleles. Uh, so that leads to an idea that's uh, the minimum viable population size. So how many individuals do we need to have in a population to ensure the survival of that population? What's the minimum chance? And we already had an example with the elephant seals where even though the population got down to 20 individuals, they still managed to make a comeback. Uh, but what that would be below what we would normally consider to be a minimum viable population size. Normally, uh, it's somewhere between 100 to 1,000 individuals. Uh, when a population gets below 10,000 individuals, that's when conservationists start to worry about that species because we're heading towards a level where you can't avoid inbreeding. Uh, once you have a population that's only 100 or fewer individuals, you're not going to be able to avoid inbreeding and you're definitely in the extinction vortex. Uh, so grizzly bears are an interesting study in that as well and many of these things are only possible because of DNA availability recently. And luckily for many animals like grizzly bears that you wouldn't want to uh, trap very often, you don't need to trap them to get DNA because there's DNA in their feces. So all you need to do is pick up grizzly bear poop and you can analyze their DNA and see how closely related individuals are in a particular population. So uh, grizzly bears were never completely extirpated from the lower 48 states, although they were eliminated from, by hunting from many of the states in which they occurred. But they're still around in a few western states, um, including Montana and um, Wyoming. Uh, 
Uh, so where Yellowstone National Park is. And the population got down to about 70 to 90 individuals. And they were estimated to have uh, about an, at that level, about a 95% chance of surviving uh, for 100 years. But, you know, really we want a population that's large enough that they could survive indefinitely. Now, luckily for grizzlies, grizzlies are fairly mobile, um, especially young grizzlies will wander far from the area in which they were born and seek out new er areas. So if hunting ceases of grizzlies, they would invade neighboring areas. Now, unfortunately, they're not very welcome by ranchers and people who live near grizzly territories uh, because they will kill livestock if there aren't enough wild animals available. They would prefer to stay away from people, but they will go after uh, domestic animals if there isn't anything else available. So the population in Yellowstone has increased, unfortunately, because of inbreeding, the effective population size is much smaller. So even though there's 400, the effective population size is only about 125 individuals. So it, increasing the genetic diversity of those animals is really important. So uh, and the way to do that, like the Didi did with the prairie chickens, is to move them. Take bears from a much more genetically diverse population, which in this case would be Alaska, and introducing them. And just a couple of bears here and there every decade would uh, rapidly increase the genetic variation in the population. Uh, so that, it doesn't really take much to do that, although, you know, moving grizzly bears is a, a much bigger task than moving prairie chickens, uh, as you can imagine, and much more expensive since they have to be um, anesthetized, caged, transported. Uh, but it, it, conservationists can make a huge difference to a population, and this is exactly what they've done with cheetahs as well when it was discovered that cheetahs are now many fragmented populations that were, is, most of the populations were very inbred, uh, very low genetic diversity. And there, uh, there was an effort for, since the early 1980s, to move cheetahs around to different wild populations to increase their genetic diversity and increase the likelihood that cheetahs are going to survive into the future. Um, so when a population is declining before it's actually gotten to that level, uh, that's the time to act. Because if you wait until we already have a really small, uh, non-genetically diverse population, you have to have a much more aggressive approach. But if you can identify populations when they're just in the declining trend and they haven't yet gotten to the endangered status, identify the factors that are contributing to their decline and reversing those, if possible, is really a much better approach. Acting when they're only threatened and declining. And, and we have had, had some good successes with that. Uh, one success has been with bald eagles and other raptors benefited from the same um, uh, intervention. So uh, bald eagles used to be extremely prevalent all over North America, all the way uh, down to um, approximately where the Mexican border is. And they were hunted out uh, from most of the lower 48 states. They were almost completely extirpated from the lower 48 states, not just because of hunting, but also because of a pesticide, DDT, uh, which contributed to um, thinning eggshells and lower reproductive success of bald eagles. And they have made an enormous comeback. So they were declared, they were never endangered everywhere. Uh, for example, in Alaska, Bald eagles were never endangered. However, in the lower 48 states, they were uh, locally endangered. So it, uh, hunting them was outlawed 
in the 1970s because of the Endangered Species Act when that was passed. Uh, one of the few things that um, Nixon did that was good, <laughs> he, did, he actually did a, passed a few laws or signed a few laws, environmental laws that were very good, like the Clean Air Act uh, and the Endangered Species Act were both signed by uh, Richard Nixon. Um, and one of the things it did was ban DDT. DDT is a pesticide that's used mostly against mosquitoes. And uh, it's not really needed. It wasn't. There are still countries that use DDT where malaria is endemic still, and it's extremely effective against mosquitoes. But it was banned here because it was making raptors' eggshells thinner because, of course, they're at the top of the food chain. So DDT is a fat-soluble, persistent chemical that stays in the fat and accumulates, it bioaccumulates in um, uh, predators. And the bald eagle has made a huge comeback. I never saw a bald eagle, uh, a real live one, except in a zoo until I was in college, and I rem in, which was in the 80s. And I remember very vividly the very first time I saw a wild bald eagle downstate Illinois uh, when I was canoeing. And now they're all over the place, even in the Chicago area. I live fairly close to the Fox River, and there's quite a number of bald eagles along the Fox River. Uh, I used to have backyard chickens, and we even had an, a bald eagle take one of our chickens one year. They are enormous, by the way, <laughs> much bigger than you think they are uh, when you see them up close. So they've made an enormous comeback. So have other birds of prey, including owls and hawks. Uh, have benefited from the exact same law. Uh, so success story with that. So if, if you can identify factors that are causing the decline and reverse those, that makes a big difference. Um, so sustaining biodiversity also depends on preserving the entire ecosystem. So for bald eagles, luckily, their food source wasn't really the problem, that the entire ecosystem wasn't really the problem for bald eagles. But for other cases, like for uh, the ivory-billed woodpecker, they lost with their ecosystem, and there, there wasn't any way to save them without saving the whole ecosystem. And that's generally can be true. So uh, one of the problems now is that wild areas are becoming more and more fragmented. And one of the problems with that is, for example, like with an old growth forest, the edges of the forest where the edges are along highways or are cleared for homes or whatever, uh, that edge is a different ecosystem. It gets more sunlight because you don't have the dense tree canopy. There are plants that can live along that edge that can't live in the uh, denser part of the forest and organisms that depend on that dense old growth forest are the ones that lose out the most when you have fragmentation because the edge of the forest or the edge of the tall grass prairie or whatever ecosystem we're talking about is not the same it's a different it has different characteristics. And that uh, was studied experimentally with logging in the Amazon River Basin. Uh, species were studied, and the smaller the fragment of forest that was left, the lower the biodiversity in those fragments, even though initially, uh, before the surrounding areas were logged, each of those forest fragments was equally diverse. But once you turn them into forest fragments, because there's so much edge that's different, it gets more sunlight, has different species around the edge, and the rare species will just be lost by chance. Uh, they will become very small populations and then be lost, ultimately. So having a bunch of small fragments of wild areas uh, isn't always a good idea. And so connecting them, connecting these uh, dispersed patches can be really helpful. And sometimes these are called corridors or uh, um, ways that connect these, these fragments, um, especially for animals moving and crossing highways or crossing subdivisions. 
uh, having a wild corridor that connects all of these areas can keep animals from encountering humans, can keep animals from being hit by cars, can allow immigration and emigration from different populations so that we don't get have isolated, fragmented populations that then become inbred and lose genetic diversity. So there's a, there's a lot of uses for these. And in some cases, these uh, bridges have been built um, to facilitate, sometimes they go under the road as well, depending on what's, uh, what the, what's around, but providing a way for animals to cross roads and cross other um, uh, and large uh, human occupied areas, like providing uh, almost like a park, uh, a long skinny park that goes down the middle of subdivisions and urban areas to allow animals to move uh, is a good thing. Uh, but, you know, bad things can also travel then between the populations like diseases. But I think ultimately having uh, uh, connecting these fragmented populations, this has worked really well in Florida with the endangered uh, Florida panther allowing wild corridors for the panthers to move. Panthers were getting hit by cars all the time. That's still a problem in Florida. Uh, but allowing ways for the panthers to cross highways, because they would really rather not cross the road. Uh, establishing preserves and protected areas is also really important and really started this idea of setting aside nature preserves for the public and to be owned by the government really only started maybe a little over a hundred years ago. Uh, right now, worldwide, only about 7% of the world's land is set aside as some kind of a government preserve or nature reserve. Uh, and how small they are can make a difference. Um, and again, we have the same problem of we're having small protected areas with isolated, fragmented populations that may not have immigration or emigration to other populations to increase their genetic diversity. Uh, and what is our goal for these nature preserves? Uh, and usually it's that we, we want to keep some wild areas untouched and not manage them too much. Uh, so there has been an effort in the last 30 years to identify biodiversity hotspots, places in the world that have large numbers of really unique species. So an endemic species, see that word endemic. So an endemic species is a species found nowhere else in the world. Like this image here, this is from California. These are uh, there are several species, uh, well, I think two species of giant redwoods, and they're found nowhere else in the world. So those would be endemic to Western uh, North America, and I think they're only in the United States. I don't think there are any outside of the United States, uh, like in Canada or Mexico. Uh, so that's what a biodiversity hotspot is. So we want to make sure that if there's a biodiversity hotspot, that some of it is being set aside in a reserve. So here's some of the areas that have been identified. The purple areas have been identified as terrestrial hotspots, so land, and the little triangles are where there are marine uh, hotspots. And you can see that these are, that most of them are fairly close to the equator as we would sort of expect because uh, Warmer and wetter leads to higher species diversity just in general. So we would expect uh, warmer, wetter areas to tend to be biodiversity hotspots. And we can see that, you know, the only place in the United States is uh, California and Hawaii. And maybe Puerto Rico, if that becomes a state in the next few years. Um, so... Nature, res nature reserves or preserves, as it says a sign down here in Illinois, we call them nature preserves. Uh, that means that they are relatively undisturbed. So there's not going if it's a nature preserve, that means there's not going to be any logging. There's not going to be any construction. Uh, they're going to possibly be managed, like maybe by reintroducing species that have disappeared but used to be there. Um, 
but they're basically considered to be uh, a place where we can observe what nature is doing all by itself without human interference. And these are in many er many countries have taken uh, advantage of this idea and really gone crazy with it. One of them is Costa Rica. Costa Rica uh, has a policy that tourism, ecotourism is a good source of money and really important and they have they have become one of the best countries in the world in terms of preserving wild areas. And this just shows, oh, here's, here's Costa Rica and Central America. And um, we can see here all of the dark green, those are nature preserves. And they really do a, a fantastic tourist business there. Tourism is their biggest industry. And uh, uh, many other countries are trying to figure out what they did to make all this money and how they can do it as well. Uh, there are marine reserves and these are areas where you can't fish. Um, sometimes you can fish in a marine reserve if you're like scuba diving and you're spear fishing, but not uh, commercial fishing. Commercial fishing would not be allowed. And this is to allow fish to reproduce and this has been really successful it has been found in many areas that marine reserves, having a, a, a marine reserve where there's no fishing allowed, improves the number of fish in surrounding areas, especially if they turn into an off-limits area, places where the, the fish normally spawn, then that means more, more fish for the fishermen. So this has been uh, very successful in many places in the world. So this is uh, the Keys, the Florida Keys down here. And there's a large marine sanctuary where no commercial fishing is allowed. Although scuba divers can fish. If you, if you are spear fishing, you, you can fish. Um, there's also a small amount of uh, lobster fishing that goes on down there. But... Uh, this has been very, very successful and has increased the populations of fish outside the reserve, which kind of makes sense. If you're fishing everywhere and fishing, uh, commercial fishing is very damaging to the ecosystem because they drag nets along the bottom. They have weighted nets and drag them along the bottom and just destroy everything. Uh, having an area where that's not allowed is extremely beneficial. Uh, to the fishermen. Uh, and that was initially a hard sell to the fishing industry that if we don't let you fish in the best fishing spots, you'll actually benefit from that. Uh, but it has turned out they, they're, they believe in that now. That's been proven over and over in dis different places in the world that uh, creating these reserves is very beneficial. Um, urban ecology has become very popular, and we can see it in the, in Chicago with the restoration of the Chicago Canal uh, that uh, used to be just oh, terrible. And now the banks have been allowed to be restored, and they've picked up trash and stopped dumping uh, into the canal, and now people canoe on it, and you can even eat the fish uh, out of it, uh, and it's much cleaner. So th this, people have, have realized that you can't use these open waterways as open sewers or garbage dumps that, that ultimately uh, harms everyone. And it's much better to try to maintain them as clean and nice as possible, that that provides recreation for the people in the city, if nothing else. So some of the ways that human actions are damaging the environment. Uh, one is nutrient enrichment. So as we'll talk more about when we get to plants, certain nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus and iron are limiting on uh, growth in ocean and marine ecosystems. And when you have runoff from agriculture, from fertilizer, you can create problems with that. Uh, accumulation of toxins, this one is something, you know, we've been talking about for a hundred years. Many industries have toxic runoff that uh, is strictly regulated in most places in the United States now because of learning that lesson the hard way. Uh, 
because of industry uh, causing all kinds of damage to the environment. Uh, climate change we already talked about, and we'll talk a little bit about ozone depletion, which is something that we're less concerned about now uh, than we were 20 years ago. So nutrient enrichment. Uh, farming puts extra nutrients into the soil. All farmers use fertilizer. Uh, even organic farmers are using fertilizer. Uh, because if you're growing crops in the same land year after year after year, the soil becomes depleted, you have to add something to it. You have to add nutrients to the soil or you're not going to be able to grow the same crops year after year. So especially uh, nitrogen and phosphorus get added. So what happens is nutrients run off and Louisiana, had a large part of Louisiana here is the Mississippi River Delta. So the Mississippi River comes down here and empties into the Gulf of Mexico. And what happens is when you have excess nutrients, you get phytoplankton blooms. So algae that are whose growth is normally limited by the lack of nutrients in the water, all this agricultural runoff has extra nutrients in it. So you get a big algal bloom, the algae dies and it sinks to the bottom and bacteria that use oxygen break down all of the phytoplankton and decompose them but in the process use up oxygen and then that leads to dead zones. And this is a big problem in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, there are dead zones where no fish can survive because of uh, this agricultural runoff leading to an oxygen depletion because of all of the bacteria decomposing all of the dead algae that bloom because of that. Um, toxins in the environment, this is something that, uh, at least within the U.S., we are making progress on this and have since the 1970s, since really tough environmental laws started to go into place. But there's constant pushback from corporations to want to loosen up these laws because they cost them money. But really, uh, going back to the uh, uh, hugely huge pollution problems that were around in the 60s and 70s before all these environmental laws, I do not think is a good solution. Uh, many of these harmful substances build up as the food moves up the food chain, like mercury. Uh, one of the reasons that we have to be careful of what fish we eat, ocean fish, is because of mercury pollution in the ocean. It is not natural mercury in the ocean. It is there in the ocean because of human activity. Um, I think it's from gold mining, if I remember right, where most of the mercury ended up in the ocean. Uh, which means if we stop putting it into the ocean, it would eventually precipitate out into the bottom and get buried and it wouldn't be a problem anymore. But it's the large carnivorous fish that have the highest levels of mercury, like swordfish. Swordfish are at the top of the food chain, so they have very high levels of mercury. But something like salmon, that is not a carnivorous fish, it eats plankton, uh, it has relatively low levels of mercury. So, and this, this is called biomagnification, uh, when you have toxins building up as you move up in the trophic levels. Um, so, besides DDT being banned in the 1970s, in the Great Lakes, there's another chemical that's of concern, not mercury, but PCBs. Uh, PCBs, or um, polychlorobiphenols, I think is what the PCB is short for, are from paper processing and wood processing. And there used to be a lot of paper mills uh, around the Great Lakes that were spewing PCBs into the lakes. They're not allowed to anymore, and they haven't been since uh, the 1980s and 1970s. Those laws started to go into effect. And what we can see on all these little graphs here is the decline in PCBs in fish as time went on. So the... Um, the yellow and orange ones, those are the older years. Uh, those are 1991 to 2009. And then the um, 
uh, slightly more recent. To, uh, the green to the blue is 1992 to 2008. And so we can see that the levels here of PCBs found in caught fish uh, in walleye and lake trout, which never had walleye. Walleye are very good fish, especially fried, batter fried walleye, really good. Um, the levels of PCBs in these fish at different places in the Great Lakes has been steadily declining since 1990. And that's good. That means that stopping dumping into the lakes has made a difference. Uh, another way that we can see this with the PCB, so here's um, uh, also with, uh, you know, seagulls, herring gulls. These are the common ones that we see. They're very common. Uh, in the plankton, uh, very low concentrations. In smelt that eat the plankton, uh, smelt or small fish, uh, still relatively low. Um, lake trout that eat the smelt, higher concentrations. By the time you get to the top of the food chain here to the to the seagulls, uh, it could be toxic enough that it will actually lower their reproductive rate. And that's the that's the real problem, is that the the individuals lower down in the food chain might not have their fitness affected, but the top predators might have their fitness affected. Fitness being, in evolutionary terms, the ability to reproduce and produce offspring. So uh, that's the problem, is that this the levels, because PCBs, again, are fat soluble, so they stay in the fat of organisms and in cell membranes, that will get magnified as it goes up in the food chain. And mercury in the ocean does the same thing. Uh, we talked a bit about global warming already and the evidence that global warming is being caused by human activity. Uh, we already have measurable ways that global warming is affecting various populations. And one of the things that conservationists are trying to do now is estimate how many species might go extinct in the next hundred years if global warming continues. Because we can already see species going extinct because of the changing climate. So organisms that are temperature sensitive, uh, if they can't tolerate summer temperatures above a certain level, if it warms up just a little bit, those populations will start to decline. Uh, the ecosystems that are being affected the most are the coldest ecosystems. So near the equator, there's barely any detectable warming at all. The further away you go from the equator, and the closer you get to the North and the South Pole, the more rapid the changes are and the, the more the increase in warming is detectable. So tundra is warming the most out of any of those biomes that we talked about. Tundra, remember, is characterized by permafrost. There's no trees uh, because it's too cold. And if you start to melt permafrost, uh, that's going to become a source of methane and carbon dioxide, which are both global warming gases. Uh, so tundra is generally a carbon dioxide sink because of the low rate of decomposition. Remember that the rate of decomposition is related to both temperature and rainfall or the amount of moisture. If it's really dry, the rate of decomposition is slow. If it's really cold, the rate of decomposition is very slow. And that means that if things don't decompose, that means the carbon stays in there like a peat bog. The plants die and they just pile up. They don't decompose. That carbon stays. So once you start to warm up the tundra and the permafrost melts, what that means is decomposition is going to happen. And when things decompose, carbon dioxide is released. There's also all that frozen permafrost, there's trapped methane, which is also a product of decomposition. That's going to be released into the atmosphere. So uh, some places um, 
uh, some ecosystems like tundra and like northern Canada, is estimated that the, the average temperature might increase by as much as 6 degrees Celsius, even though the average worldwide might only increase by 1.5 degrees Celsius. So that's going to make an enormous difference to those ecosystems. Uh, and an example, here's a, um, an animal which a lot of people think is a rodent, the pikas. They kind of look like rodents. They have a, a weird little squeaky, shouty kind of a call. Um, but they're actually more closely related to hares and rabbits. Um, but they're cold weather specialists. They, they hibernate in the winter. They have, um, they're adapted to the very short summers in the near Arctic regions. And uh, they are, however, very temperature sensitive. They cannot tolerate uh, high summer temperatures. They don't cool off very easily. They don't pant or have any other way to cool off in hot weather. And when it's, if it's too hot, they, uh, have, um, they fail reproducing and they may not survive uh, the next winter. So... Uh, Organisms like, like these that live in these colder, near-Arctic regions, they're going to be affected the most by global warming, um, like caribou as well. Uh, caribou populations have been affected. So this is just showing um, uh, pika habitat here in area, and it's this graph, and this is the temperature, that small populations, again, we see the effect of small populations. Small populations and warm temperatures mean that they're uh, disappearing in those areas. So each little dot here represents a population, and then this graph shows the area of habitat that that population has. So the red dots are populations that have gone extinct, and so you can see those correspond to warmer summer temperatures and smaller populations, smaller areas. So the warmest temperatures uh, and having a smaller habitat, which means a small population, uh, they are losing out. Now it's possible this could cause natural selection as well. If climate change happens slowly enough, uh, natural selection will occur, and individuals that are better adapted to the warmer temperatures will survive, and those that cannot adapt to the warmer temperatures will not survive and reproduce, and that will change the species. If it happens too rapidly, though, uh, that will not occur. Um, so there has been changes. So caribou live in the very cold areas. In tundra, they eat lichens in the winter and uh, dead grass, and they try to time their reproduction to when the, the, the very short summer season occurs so that uh, their babies can eat grass because that's what they need. Uh, they need to be able to have some fresh forage, and also um, the new mothers also need to have that fresh forage to produce enough milk for their babies. So what they've noticed is that uh, the plants appearing, the first growth of green grass, is occurring earlier and earlier in the growing season. So you can see here the day of the year calving begins and the day of the year plant growth begins. That's the red. So this line here, this so here's our years here, 2000 to 2010. And every year, the when the first new green plant growth appears has been getting earlier and earlier in the year. And in fact, it shifted by almost 20 days uh, earlier. And the day of, of calving has shifted slightly, but not nearly enough. So now there's a mismatch between when the calves are born and when the grass is available. Um, and eventually the caribou may adapt, but by natural selection, which means individual caribou are not going to adapt, but some will survive and some will not. So sometimes uh, species will, some species are very mobile and will move as a result of changing temperatures. 
And we have seen this with various ocean species, with uh, the warming temperatures uh, of oceans. Fish species have been spotted very far north, the, much further north than they have been in the past. Uh, warm water species uh, have been found much further north. Um, and even something like a sea urchin can move into new areas as the temperature changes. So sea urchins uh, have expanded their range. They don't do very well in really cold water. Um, but if the water warms up a little bit, sea urchins can take over new areas. And if there are no sea urchin predators yet, uh, the sea urchins will just eat everything in sight. So here we have um, uh, a study that was done looking at sea urchins and how well they reproduce relative to the water temperature. So here's the water temperature on the x-axis and the probability of sea urchins reproducing. And you can see that they do have an ideal temperature. If it's too warm, 20 degrees uh, Celsius would be pretty warm for a marine ecosystem. Uh, you can see that they have an ideal temperature. And so if an area is warming up, the sea urchins could move in and reproduce in an area where previously they had been kept out by the cold water temperature. Uh, so finding solutions to climate change usually involves two things. One is reducing CO2 emissions, since we know that is the primary cause of global warming, is fossil fuels. Humans uh, burning fossil fuels, burning coal and uh, natural gas and uh, products uh, from crude oil like gasoline, that is the primary reason. We've been doing that at a large scale for 300 years, and that is the primary cause. So reducing that should be our number one priority. Trying to, after the fact, remove CO2 from the atmosphere, uh, we don't have any good way to do that right now. That's uh, um, a lot of hand-waving at this point. People have a lot of ideas, but there isn't any good one just yet. Uh, also, in increasing the amount of CO2 that's removed naturally by plants. Plants are way better at removing CO2 from the atmosphere than any industrial solution that we've come up with. So planting more trees, uh, and there are several projects around the world of replanting areas that were completely deforested in the last few hundred years in Europe. Uh, that's a fantastic idea. So if you personally want to do something for uh, CO2 and reducing CO2 in the atmosphere, plant some trees. That's a great idea. Trees remove CO2 and keep it out of the atmosphere. Uh, ozone is a completely different question. A lot of people conflate ozone and global warming, but it really has nothing to do with it. Ozone is not it doesn't have anything to do with the greenhouse effect. Uh, ozone protects living things from ultraviolet rays, just accidentally. <laughs> so ozone is just oxygen, but there's three atoms of oxygen instead of two. And ultraviolet radiation damages DNA. So one of the uh, protective things that we have as life on Earth is um, ozone protecting protecting us from those ultraviolet rays. And it was noticed in the 1970s that the amount of ozone in the atmosphere was decreasing measurably and alarmingly so. And so, uh, you know, people were speculating not just is that going to increase the amount of skin cancer in humans, but also what about all of the plants and microscopic organisms and fungi that don't have protection from that ultraviolet and now are going to have their DNA damaged by ultraviolet light. So it was discovered what the cause was. So, okay, so this is just showing actual measurements of the ozone layer and how it was going down, 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 and now it's kind of stabilized. And the reason for that is because it was discovered that the reason the ozone was suddenly declining in the atmosphere was because of uh, refrigerants, specifically chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs. Freon is one of those. 
Uh, and these were a new, safer refrigerant that started to be used in the 1940s and 50s. Before that, uh, uh, electric refrigeration units used um, ammonia and other toxic compounds as refrigerants. Those were really bad to have in your house because if they sprung a leak, they were really toxic. Um, CFCs were relatively non-toxic to humans, so they were considered very safe, and they very quickly were found in every electrically powered refrigeration unit and air conditioning unit, car air conditioners, they were everywhere. Um, and they get released into the atmosphere. You know, if your refrigeration unit has a leak, your car air conditioner has a leak, they, it all gets leaked into the atmosphere. So massive amounts of these CFCs were going into the atmosphere, and they take ozone, O3, and turn it into O2 through a very simple chemical reaction. And CFCs are also very persistent in the atmosphere. They, uh, they remain in the atmosphere for decades. So their use was banned uh, by international treaty in 92, um, 93, can't remember exactly which year. And since then, their use has declined precipitously and now the uh, amount of ozone in the atmosphere has stabilized. Uh, which is which is good. Although it'll probably take another 50 years before it is noticeably recovered. Um, and the only reason we talk about the ozone hole over Antarctica is because of the way air circulation is in the atmosphere. In the um, Antarctic um, uh, summer, the just the way the air circulation is, it doesn't mix much with the rest of the atmosphere, and so you get a noticeable hole in the ozone. But it's really thinning everywhere. It's just most noticeable over Antarctica. Uh, so, oh, a little earlier than I thought. 1987 is when uh, uh, the CF CFCs were um, banned and started to be phased out. But because CFCs are very persistent, and they're still around in a few places, even though they're not manufacturing them anymore. I mean, I'm sure that there are people still, you know, using Freon for something somewhere. Um, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while for the ozone to noticeably start to increase again, but at least it's stopped decreasing, so nobody's really talking about it or worrying about it anymore. Um, so, uh, so what's going to happen in the future? Uh, the biggest thing I think is going to be educating people about what actually we're faced with, uh, with conservation and getting local people involved in conservation efforts in their area. We can't, uh, go in and impose conservation ideas on people living in whatever area we're interested in, uh, the local people have to do it and have to be involved with that. And I think that's really where um, many of these international organizations that are interested in conservation are heading. Because there are many benefits to the local people who live near these biodiverse areas. Uh, and if they knew what the benefits were, they would be right on board with preserving the, their own local uh, heritage and biodiversity. Um, okay, next up, uh, we will talk about plants.